G'day, g'day How you going? What do you know? He'll strike a light G'day, g'day And how you going? Just say g'day, g'day, g'day And you'll be right Now, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. We're going to pause our study through 1 Thessalonians uh, for these next two weeks. And I want to do a special message on the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And the title of this message is The Triumphal Entry, Behold, Your King is Coming to You. Uh, The goal would be to really kind of go through this entire chapter, Mark chapter 11. Uh, If you want other references of what the story takes place, um, Matthew uh, 21, Luke 19, and John 12 all talk about uh, this triumphal entry. Um, but in the 10th chapter of Mark, uh, w- w- the last part of it is where Jesus is passing through Jericho. And um, they're coming up in the area what is called the Transjordan, uh, the other side of the Jordan River, and he's making his way to Jerusalem in order to be crucified. And Jesus knows exactly what is happening and what he's going to be facing. And, and now he's on his way to Jerusalem. So let's read verses 1 through 10 right now. It says in verse 1, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, Go into the village opposite of you. And as soon as you have entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has set. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it. And so they went their way and they found the colt uh, tied by the door outside on the street and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there and said, what are you doing loosening the colt? And so they spoke to him, just as Jesus had commanded, and so they let them go. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father and David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this passage of Scripture that we see your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it really sets the stage for the week to come, for your death, burial, and resurrection. So as we study this text, Lord, and this passage, and this chapter as well, we see the important things that you want to communicate to us. We see the things that you went through. And so I pray you speak to us all in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now to give you a bit of a snapshot of what's going to happen in this week to come um, and what's going to unfold this week is typically known as the uh, Passion Week or the Holy Week. And uh, there's eight important days to keep in mind uh, as we go through this particular time. Uh, This particular day that we just read about is Palm Sunday. It's the triumphal entry, the royal entry. And then what takes place on Monday is really the cleansing of the temple. And uh, Tuesday is kind of a day of conflict. There's all kinds of uh, other teaching that Jesus does on that particular day. And you see throughout the other Gospels and uh, even the rest of uh, Mark all talk about what's taking place on that particular day. Wednesday is a day of silence. Not much is mentioned uh, in the Gospels on on Wednesday. Thursday is the uh, Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane, the betrayal and the arrest. And then Friday is the trial before the Jews, the uh, denial of Peter, uh, the trial before Pilate, the cross and the burial. Uh, That takes place on Friday. Saturday, the guards are posted uh, at the tomb, and it's really a day of grieving for those who love Jesus. And then Sunday, as you know, is Resurrection Sunday, uh, where the tomb is empty, there's the risen Lord, he appears to the disciples and Mary Magdalene, and also the the two on the road to Emmaus, as Luke uh, talks about. So that's kind of a snapshot of, of the week ahead of us. And again, 
Uh, I would encourage you to read all these chapters uh, in the Gospels to see what's going on and what Jesus, his final, if you knew you had one final week to live, what would you do? What would you say? What would you communicate? And this is what Jesus wanted to communicate to us. Now, in our passage here on the 11th chapter, right after leaving Jericho, uh, coming up the road toward Jerusalem, it was around 18 miles or 28 to 30 kilometers or so uh, from Jericho to the edge of Bethphage and Bethany. So it was a bit of a journey and you're going up uh, to Jerusalem because Jericho was below sea level. So uh, so there was this big uh, journey ahead of them. Jesus, as you know, was set on his mission and why he came from heaven to earth to redeem mankind, to die for the sins of all of us. And he knew what had to be done and he had a sense in how to accomplish it. Over and over throughout scriptures and even in in Mark uh, chapter 8 verse 31 says, for example, that the Son of Man, uh, he, he began to teach the disciples, the Son of Man Uh, must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, to be killed and to rise again on the third day. So multiple times throughout the scriptures you see this over and over taking place. And we see Jesus, he was determined to fulfill and to complete his mission and ultimately to go to the cross and, uh, and also to be resurrected on the third day. Now this was news that was hard for the disciples to accept and to grasp. In fact, in uh, Mark um, 8.32, just after that passage that we just read, uh, Peter takes Jesus and pulls him aside and rebukes him. It's, you know, essentially Paul is saying, stop thinking this way. You know, you, you know don't let this happen. And uh, perhaps uh, Peter must have felt the humility of, uh, and the humiliation of the cross. And that no one should suffer innocently. And that no one should be humbly, you know, used and abused and rejected. But yet the very thing that uh, Peter is trying to talk Jesus out of uh, was going to happen. And you see in Mark or uh, Matthew 21 verse 4, uh, Jesus came to do what was fulfilled. He says, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. So this triumphal entry as Jesus goes up to Jerusalem with the focus on the cross. Now before we go too far into this, uh, you need to uh, hold your finger here. Turn to Daniel chapter 9 for a moment. Daniel chapter 9. And you'll see this prophetic, and this is one of the most important uh, prophecies in Scripture and in the entire Bible. And uh, there's a precision in what has taken place within this uh, chapter. This chapter was written hundreds and hundreds of years uh, before. And so this prophecy of Daniel predicted this very moment uh, that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. So in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 through 26, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth to the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The street will be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war as desolation are determined. Now, pause right there. It was in the early 1900s, there was a man by the name Sir Robert Anderson. And he was a policeman, an investigator, he's a Christian, and he wrote a book called The Coming Prince. It's a fantastic book to read, very specific, and again, you can download it on Amazon. Um, but he talks about this particular scripture, and he goes through the maths within this uh, context. Now, in Scripture, again, when it talks about a week here, it's seven years. So a seven-year period is a week in Scripture. And so 62 weeks equals uh, uh, 334 uh, years. Uh, Seven weeks is 49 years. And when you add them up together, it's 483 years. Now, when they did the calculation, they didn't do the 365-year calendar like we do. They had a 360-year calendar. So when you multiply uh, 483 by 360 years, you get 173,880 um, days. So they did the calculation. 
of that. Now, when the decree was given in Scripture, it authorizes the rebuilding of the city and the walls that takes place in Nehemiah chapter 2. And the date of the month is uh, Nisan, uh, so not the car, Nisan, but uh, Nisan, the month. It's the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, which was around 445 B.C. So that date is well attested in, in uh, history. And so the summary of Sir Robertson Anderson's book chronicles the span which really started March 14th, 445 B.C. to April 6th, 32 A.D. And that's this day that we're reading about right now, the triumphal entry of Christ. So predictive prophecy, which is what we just read about in Daniel chapter 9, is divine intelligence both in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. Like when you read through things that are happening in the, uh, from the Gospels, from what Jesus is telling us what's going to happen, even Revelation, it's all predictive prophecy. But prophecy proves the existence of God. But not to everyone's satisfaction. A lot of people have a hard time with predictive prophecy. But prophecy really authenticates the deity of Jesus. Prophecy demonstrates and illustrates the history and authenticity of the Bible. Now, as you know, and some of you probably have heard before, that the Old Testament carries and contains some 300 uh, prophecies of the Messiah specifically fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, and some people would even object saying that, well, uh, those prophecies were written at the time uh, of Christ or afterwards. And so these are self-fulfilling prophecies that Jesus and his disciples manufactured in order to appear to fulfill prophecy. So this is how they tried to explain it away. But here's the fact of the matter is, and facts, uh, again, it's not lying here, um, the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible uh, was, uh, again, the Septuagint, uh, was initiated by the reign of Ptolemy the Philadelphus, which was around 285 to uh, 246 B.C. So it's rather obvious that when you have the Greek translation of the Hebrew text that was translated 250 years, uh, 250 B.C., is sufficient to prove the existence of these prophecies well in advance uh, before the birth of life and death of Christ. And there's a great book, I highly encourage people to get it, it should be in everyone's bookshelf, it's called um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. He goes in and not only proves scripture and, and getting through the historical context and all these sort of things, but also he proves the resurrection because it was his goal to disprove the resurrection of Christ as how he came to Christ because there's overwhelming evidence, it's the most undeniable fact in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we see this day, Palm Sunday, a fulfillment of Scripture. Now back to Mark chapter 11. So our text mentions that Jesus, again, uh, he sent two of his disciples. Now we don't know who these two are. Uh, nothing's mentioned of them, so we can't speculate which two went. Um, but imagine these two guys going to um, do what Jesus told them to do. Uh, again, think of the conversation. Just think of the discussions, the feelings, the thoughts, the questions that were going through the disciples' minds. And, um, you know, qu wondering and questioning what in the world are they doing? Why do we need to do this? For the last nine months or so, Jesus was traveling around uh, Israel and teaching and healing and delivering people. And uh, he stopped in so many different places. And maybe these are some of the things that were going through the disciples' minds. And so now he's made his last trip from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now keep in mind, as we just mentioned about the fulfillment of uh, these messianic prophecies, uh, it was close to 500 years uh, before the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, that said that the king, God's king, would enter the kingdom uh, by riding into Jerusalem on a back of a donkey. And Jesus does this very thing. But realize that this was no small task. These animals don't welcome such an experience, even at a year's age from what uh, uh, we hear, that it's quite a, capable of dumping you off to the side of the road. And again, no one ever rode on this particular donkey before. So here's this animal that no one had ever sat on. That was part of what had to uh, take place. No one had to ever sit on this particular, no one said, hey, let me try this donkey out. It had, no one could have sit on this particular donkey. It was set aside. And so it was set aside for a specific use. 
And, uh, but Jesus sat on him, and he was quiet and uh, responsive and obedient, and it carried him through the streets of the city. And it's showing that Jesus is master over the creation. You see, creation must submit to its creator. And that's what we see here. And there's no doubt the people, as they're along the streets, and uh, because it was Passover time, so people would flood Jerusalem during this period of time. So people are aware of what's going on. Many of them have been waiting for this event. They're waiting for Jesus to make such a move. They had an expectation that a king would deliver them. Uh, There was an expectation of a coming king uh, that would smash the Roman oppressors and restore Israel to its rightful place. But there was a problem here with this line of thinking. You see, the other conquering kings would come in on these beautiful horses and these massive stallions. But Jesus is coming in on a donkey. It's not quite that picturesque of a conquering king uh, that you would think. But you see, the people were looking uh, for someone to overthrow Rome. But Jesus had not come for that. He didn't come for war. He came for peace and reconciliation of mankind to the Lord. But nevertheless, the people were full of expectation. Now, according to church history, um, they were reminded 150 years earlier uh, when Simon Maccabeus had delivered Jerusalem. And on that occasion, known as the Second Maccabean Revolt, uh, a great celebration was held and praise and these palm branches and uh, musical instruments and great celebration was taking place. And so they believed that they were going to be delivered once again. But it's going to be a different type of deliverance, a more important deliverance, that of from sin and death. In fact, as Jesus launched his ministry three years before, um, he stood up in the synagogue, and if you remember, uh, the scroll was written, uh, given to him. And he read from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through the first verse of chapter, uh, verse 2. Um, and... Um, And then he sat down and said, today it's fulfilled in your hearing. And the passage goes like this, just to remind you, and I'll continue through verse 3, so you see the full context here. It says, the the Spirit of the Lord uh, God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and open the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where Jesus stopped. But the passage continues, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And Jesus fulfilled that. So as we see in our text here, again, Jesus, he gives a uh, uh, the disciples an answer when people will question uh, them about taking this uh, donkey, the colt. Uh, and he says, you know, simply say that the Lord has need of them. Now, why would Jesus need a donkey? Why would he need a colt? And, and again, in our text here, it just says that uh, he needed a colt. In other passages, there was a donkey and a colt. Uh, so they went together. But it was in the, really, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. That was the bottom line here. But think about it for a moment, that God, by His power and His majesty and His perfect wisdom, prepared these instruments to be at the right place at the right time in order to fulfill His perfect purpose. So that's the majesty that you see with Jesus, all-knowing. He knew exactly where these, these uh, animals would be. What an amazing thought to consider this. And uh, But it would... Would it surprise you that the Lord needs you as well as he needed these donkeys? You know, and you apply it into a personal context. What an illustration of grace as well. uh, That people, again, they don't like to be uh, compared to a donkey. You might be stubborn like a donkey. Um, But uh, we do find a lot of comparisons throughout Scripture. That uh, there's uh, people are compared to uh, a pig for uncleanness. Or sheep as the ability to go astray and do their own thing. Um, uh, that sinners are compared to dogs as object of contempt, uh, or a wild donkey, to, the ability to be willful and wild. But in the context here with the, uh, the donkey, it's tied and they're colt. It kind of reminds you, and kind of a, as a word picture, just like uh, how we're tied and in bondage to sin. 
And uh, Mark's gospel tells us that they're found the colt by the door outside uh, on the street and they loosed it. And so uh, both donkey and colt were outside, not in a a comfortable stable, uh, but just kind of like before we come to Christ, we're outside of the covenant um, and and a place where the two roads met, the, the broad way which leads to destruction and there's the narrow road that leads to life. So there's this word imagery that you can picture here. But in Mark's gospel, we discover that they had never been ridden on before. That was another key component to this prophecy. So he told them to go into the village opposite of you, and you'll enter it. You'll find a colt, uh, which no one had sat. Loose it, bring it. And if anyone says to you, uh, why are you doing this? The Lord has need of it. Immediately, he will send it. And how uh, like us as well, um, that uh, it's, it's useless to, to God um, because of our flesh. Our flesh cannot please the Lord. Um, and so that's the word imagery in this particular uh, idea here. Both donkey and colt were known by the Lord. He knew ahead of time, uh, before time began, before the ministry began, uh, before prophecy was ever made. He knew this particular moment. He knew these donkeys and colt. And, and just like us, Jesus knows exactly uh, everything about us. Uh, before the uh, creation of the world, he knew uh, and had a, a understanding of, of not understanding, but he he had us in mind uh, before that began, uh, so he he knew exactly how these donkeys and colts can be used. So both donkey and colt were prepared and uh, for this particular use uh, for the Lord. We also see, uh, and just one more other thing to uh, as a personal thought and just something to think about, uh, not just to think of yourself as a donkey. Uh, but uh, do you have like a donkey to, to be used for the Lord? Whatever gift you have, whatever, Lord, it's yours, Lord. Take, use this donkey, use, use these gifts, use these talents, use this, uh, the finances, use whatever, Lord. This is yours, Lord. So that is kind of another uh, imagery to think in mind as a personal application of this sort of text. That might be a gift, a special talent, uh, technical ability, whatever. Use it, Lord. It's for your glory. And so Jesus needs all his people to carry out his purposes, to act willfully uh, to his will. So you see how Jesus carefully prepared everything. He had carefully ordered everything. And it would seem even the donkey's owner, perhaps, maybe he was a follower of Christ. Maybe he uh, wanted to have that relationship. He it was understanding what was going on. His heart was stirred and said, yes, you know, whatever he needs, give it to him. What a remarkable thought. But as we see in verse 8 here, that the many spread their clothes and cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, these palm branches, it's typically a symbol of victory, of triumph, and of peace. So that's the imagery here. Tradition says that these palm branches on Palm Sunday originally originates from the festival uh, that the Jews had of Sukkoth, which is also known as the Feast of uh, Tabernacles or Booths. And uh, it was probably uh, a very popular holiday amongst the Jewish people in the first century. Uh, And the observance of Sukkot, the worshipers went to Jerusalem and in the temple, waving these palm branches everywhere. And as they waved these uh, branches in in procession, uh, the worshipers recited uh, from Psalm 118, which was uh, the psalm normally used at that particular time. And among those words, it says, save us. We beseech you, O Lord, save us. Uh, in Hebrew is Hosanna. And that's why you see that, that word there, Hosanna, save us. Typically, it was followed by, uh, as Psalm 118 mentions, that blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So you can see the fulfillment of this particular prophecy. And as we see these people that were shouting and screaming Hosanna, imagine the scene there. They were fervent, they were passionate, they were intense. It was loud, it was noisy, it was a celebration. Uh, The excitement there. And uh, they were saying over and over, Hosanna, save, please, save. uh, But in time it had become a shout of hope and and of rejoicing. Salvation is here. And uh, they were speaking truth. He had come to save. Um, his mission, his purpose in coming was to seek and to save the lost and to redeem mankind. He had come to set up a kingdom, but not the kingdom that these people were thinking and hoping for. Um, but uh, 
It, it was a, a, a direction that Jesus was, was going. It's not for the crown that they were hoping to place on him, but the crown of thorns, uh, the cross is where he was going. And so the kingdom was much different than which they had hoped for, uh, but it was needed all the more. For it was a kingdom of wholeness and uh, purpose and healing and forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration is the kingdom that Jesus would bring. A kingdom that ultimately would heal the sicknesses of, of the spirit and, and emotions and body. Um, by his uh, stripes we are healed. Uh, it, it repairs the relational breakdowns. It releases the oppression. Uh, it turns tragedy into joy. It defeats the power and the grip of sin and death. Uh, so this kingdom was much better what the, they were hoping for and, and wanting to see take place. Now, as the celebration was uh, moving on, and Luke's gospel tells us in chapter 19, verse 37 through 44, talks about how the Pharisees uh, were telling Jesus from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They didn't want to hear what was taking place. And I love what Jesus says uh, in verse 40. He says, But he answered and says, But I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Think how powerful that would have been. The stones crying out, if these people didn't do this, the stones itself, because the creator of the universe is walking by them. And, and again, as that passage continues, as he drew near and he saw the city and he wept, saying, if you have known, especially the day, this day, the things that would make for your peace, but now are hidden from your eyes because they were blind spiritually. The days would come upon you when your enemies would build an embankment around you and surround you and close you on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they would not leave you at one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. This was the time of their visitation. And another passage in Matthew 23 has another passage where Jesus wept over the city as well. So as Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, determined to finish what he had started, to go to the cross, and with that in mind, what Jesus is about to do will ultimately set the stage for the path that will ultimately lead him to the cross. So as Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple, notice verse 11, it says, Jesus went into Jerusalem, into the temple. When he looked around at all the things, the hour was already late. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. If you've read through the history, you know there's three main temples in Jerusalem or in Israel at the time. The first one was Solomon's temple. Uh, almost a thousand years earlier when Solomon uh, constructed the first temple. And, and we read of God's Shekinah glory uh, filling it so that the, chi- uh, the, the priest uh, couldn't get in. And the temple was there where God dwelt and the people could meet with him. Uh, it was their holiest place in the land. Uh, it was the focal point of their worship. And hundreds of years uh, uh, later, this temple was destroyed and God's people were sent to Babylon. As you read, in fact, even Daniel uh, talks about this Babylon captivity. The next temple was called Zerubbabel's temple. Uh, when they returned 70 years later, the second temple was constructed. Uh, which was nothing compared to Solomon's temple, uh, but had been called Zerubbabel's temple, as Haggai chapter 2 talks about. And it lasted for about 500 years. And then this temple that we're seeing here is known as Herod's temple. It was an amazing structure. It was built uh, with this grandiose gift to the Jews as a tribute to Herod's wealth and his power. And it took about 46 years or so to build it. Uh, and to give you the size of the feel for this particular construction, it took three people holding their arms together uh, to, to f- feel around the size of the pillars. And so everything in this temple symbolized something that was uh, used to communicate God's power and purpose. And so uh, when, when children would come by and they see these magnificent pillars in this temple and the meaning behind it, the parents would answer and say, oh, our God is so great that he upholds the heavens and the earth. And so this temple was humongous. It was huge. Uh, and, and every person there, they would see this. And so what Jesus observed during this inspection here uh, grieved him greatly, as we'll see. And you can't help but wonder what did Jesus think and feel 
as he went in through this uh, temple. The frustration that uh, ha- what would have happened to the worship in the temple. Uh, and he goes to the temple to look for serenity and, 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 uh, and worship. And, uh, and, and what should have been found in abundance, he doesn't see anything there. Uh, what, what he did find, as we'll see in just a moment, is compromise. He saw the money changers and the um, legalism to uh, liberalism, you know, doing whatever you want, to just this wide spectrum of, you know, stuff happening, straying from the word of God uh, and worshiping to, to please the whims of the people. You see corruption, you see hypocrisy, you see all these sort of things that was taking place. And so going into the temple, Jesus conducts this inspection of the heart of the nation. And this is where the very heartbeat of the nation was throbbing. It should have been representing the the worship that was lifting up to the Lord. But that's not what he found when he went there. And as he looked, what did he see? Again, the commercialism, the money changers, exploitation, corruption, injustice. Uh, He saw religious ceremony uh, carried out with no relationship with God. You know, people, they say things with their mouth, but their hearts are far from him. He didn't say a word at this point. Um, He left, and and this tour of inspection by the king had been completed. Uh, And it was late in the day, as we see in the text there, uh, but he decided to wait till the next day uh, when more people would be doing regular business there uh, before doing anything about it. And the rest of the inspection in, in Mark 11, we see the results of this particular inspection. And so the, the, the point of, of uh, this is that the Lord is, uh, the Lord, Jesus is Lord of the temple and uh, who must inspect the premises to determine whether the purpose intended by God is being fulfilled. So he can inspect, he inspects our hearts, he knows everything that goes on in our lives. Now, starting the next day, starting in verse 12, Jesus, this interesting event happens where he curses the fig tree. So notice verse 12 says the next day, which would be Monday, that when he came out of the Bethany, he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. And he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he found, when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season of figs. And in response, Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the, the disciples heard it. This incident we see Jesus, his observation and interpretation of the festive that he had just received the day before coming into Jerusalem, and he saw the nation of Israel as a barren fig tree. Uh, That's an example there. And uh, the leaves of profession, but no fruit. And so the cry of Hosanna will soon turn to the the blood-curling cry, crucify him just days later. And there's this apparent difficulty that he condemned this particular fruit tree because it had no fruit. And although the record distinctly says that there's not the season uh, for figs. So it kind of seems that Jesus is kind of uh, unreasonable or irritable at this particular point. But we know that that's not true. And uh, but how can we explain this sort of circumstance? Well, the fig trees in the Bible, uh, again, in, in, you know, in Israel, produced an early edible fruit uh, before the leaves appeared. So that was something that we need to understand. Um, it was kind of a harbinger of a regular crop. Uh, and here it's described a season of, uh, for figs. So if no early figs appeared, it was a sign that there would be no regular crop later on. So when Jesus came to the nation of Israel here and into Jerusalem, there were leaves, which speaks of profession, but there was no fruit for God. And so this was kind of a a promise without fulfillment, uh, profession without reality is the idea here. So Jesus was hungry for fruit from the nation um, because there was no early fruit, he knew that there would be no uh, f- uh, later fruit from the unbelieving people. So he cursed the fig tree. And this was kind of a predictive judgment of what would take place in 70 AD. However, this incident does not teach that Israel is going to be cursed on perpetual uh, barrenness, uh, but it was a set aside temporarily. And again, the nation of Israel was later reborn, which happened in 1948. 
all predictive prophecy. But this is the only miracle um, which Christ cursed rather than blessed. If you look through all his other um, examples in Scripture, this is the main one that you see that there's a, uh, a curse versus a blessing, destroying life rather than restoring it. And so the creator, again, of the universe, Jesus Christ, has the sovereign right to destroy an inanimate object in order to teach an important spiritual lesson and thus to save men from eternal doom. Now, though the primary interpretation of, of this passage relates to the nation of Israel, if we're to apply it to our lives personally, again, uh, how many people are hypocritical? They're all talk, but there's no walk. There's no fruit in their life as another example. And now comes the situation that we're about to read that just royally upset the chief priests and the scribes. It was like overthrowing or like throwing a rock into a wasp nest or a bee's hives, and, uh, but it had to be done. This is the cleansing of the temple. And so in verse 15 it says, So they came to Jerusalem, and then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who brought and sold, uh, uh, sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And then he taught them, saying, it is, not, is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief heard it. And sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching, and when evening had come, he went out of the city. So again, as we first of all, we saw Jesus when he first came into Jerusalem on that uh, Sunday night, uh, he went into the temple, he conducts this inspection, and this is where the very heartbeat of the nation was, where it should have been thriving in worship, um, but uh, as he looked, what did he see? He saw that commercialism, the money changers, the exploitation, the corruption, the filth, the immorality, the pride, the hypocrisy, the haughtiness, all these other things that kind of would de- describe what was happening. He saw these religious ceremonies that would be carried, you know, uh, uh, but without any meaning and purpose or relationship to the Lord. So at first he didn't say a word, but now it's time for action. You see, Jesus was so disgusted with what the wickedness that uh, these people who claim to be righteous, but they're not. Their their hearts are far from him. The irony of the sequence of events is striking. Because we saw the uh, expectations of the multitudes would have inclined and expected Jesus to to gather together his forces and to launch an all-out kind of military attack, if you will, against the strongholds of Jerusalem. But instead, Jesus marched into the temple and uh, launched a surprise attack against the religious establishment to drain the swamp, if you will. And so the Jews hoped for an attack against Rome. He raged war, but it was a war on religion. The temple became a place of thieves. You see, in those days, there was a temple tax uh, to be paid by everyone, and it was usually paid at the time of the Passover uh, season. And so people brought all kinds of coinage, uh, because uh, unlike today, all sorts of coinage were used in everyday purposes. Typically, now we just use a card and things like that. But when you came into this particular temple, uh, you had to pay your temple tax uh, with a coinage uh, that had a king's head on it, uh, usually. And, and uh, what they wanted to do is to change, change it to a coin that didn't have it because uh, they, the Jews thought uh, having a, a king's head on it or some uh, inscription on it like that would have been uh, a, a graven image. So therefore, they needed to have these money changers uh, to exchange uh, the coins. But they also charged these pilgrims um, kind of the equivalent would be kind of like a day's wages for exchanging the money. So this higher tax that took place. In addition, you were to bring an offering. Now, you could have bought a, a dove outside the temple. Uh, it would have been a lot cheaper uh, than going inside the temple and buying it. Um, but uh, the Typically, you'd have all these different flaws within these particular birds and animals that were outside. So instead, they just buy one from our temple uh, stalls that have already been prepared and inspected. And all of this enraged Jesus. So much so on this day that when Jesus came into the temple, again, he stopped dead in their tracks. And he wouldn't permit anyone to carry out this merchandise anymore. 
This meant that Jesus uh, established himself as the authority when it came uh, to temple matters. And on this particular day, Jesus not only stopped the sales that was happening, but also the sacrifices that was taking place. And this was highly symbolic because just in a couple days, uh, his body would become the final sacrifice uh, for sin in, in, in rendering all other sacrifices completely useless. And again, uh, the Bible says in Hebrews, uh, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away our sin. It's only the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the act of stopping the temple worship sealed his death, as verse 18 mentions, how the chief priests and the teachers of the law began looking for ways to destroy him, looking for ways to kill him. Now, I don't know about you, but this kind of gives me goosebumps because Jesus was essentially condemning the entire sacrificial system. Imagine the scene taking place. You know, the temple would eventually be destroyed because Jesus uh, is now going to become that meeting place between people and God. Uh, where sins would be dealt with once and for all. You don't need to go to the temple. You have a direct relationship with the Lord. And so, uh, but we, we see that um, what took place here, that the, this place became a den of thieves, as Jesus says, um, where people uh, would associate and hide uh, the, the shameful and sinful uh, condition of, of men and women in this house uh, became where these unrepentant, hypocritical sinners uh, would associate and hide and conduct their business as usual instead of it's truly a place of worship, a place of holiness. And so Jesus had at least one more time to, to make uh, a point to confirm uh, the evil and wicked hearts of, of the Jewish leaders there. And so this is one of those things that if you want to anger God, you get in the way of of people who wants to to worship the Lord and you and you deceive people. And again, uh, there's a, it'd be better for a millstone to be hung around your neck than to stumble one of his children. But can you imagine the doves flying away, the the dusk as the uh, uh, tables are being overturned, the people scampering and the traders scattering. And uh, this wasn't an impulsive show or a temper tantrum from Jesus. It was a deliberate, intentional message that Jesus wanted to convey to the people. And, uh, and uh, if we love Jesus and, and want to, to praise him, uh, we must allow his cleansing presence in our life. We need him to turn over those tables in our lives, those areas that are not pleasing to him, those areas that we haven't surrendered over to him, and let him do what he needs to do. And always we need to submit and surrender everything over to him. Uh, and this is kind of, he needs to clean house. He needs to clean house not only um, in, in the temple here, but he needs to clean house in our lives as well. And again, this temple, this house is to be a house of prayer. Uh, God's work must be always have this aroma of prayer. Uh, and the greatest thing that you can do is to learn how to pray. Again, uh, where, where we need to make this place a place of prayer, not only in this building that we meet in as a fellowship um, and, and by God's grace we will, but the house of the Lord today is in our hearts. The, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, that talks about, don't you know that you yourselves are the temple and that the, the God's Spirit dwells within you? So we are the temple of God, as the Scripture tells us. And this means that the house of prayer that God is looking for today takes place within us as born-again believers. I like how someone once summed up the need to prioritize prayer when he says, uh, one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. The devil fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. The devil laughs at our toil, he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Most of us, again, we don't need additional principles or words of exhortation that we need to pray. We know we need to, but this is the area that we lack in the most as prayer. We need uh, to be praying so much more. Now, the next thing that happens on the following day, which will be a Tuesday, uh, that Jesus is going to explain the importance of having the priority and the place of faith in the Lord. Why? Uh, because it's the object of your faith is so important. Because the Jewish leader's confidence was not in God. Their confidence was in their own standards. And so notice verse 20. It says, now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, and Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. 
And so Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for surely I say to you, whatever says to you this mountain, be moved and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says will be done, he will have what he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things that you ask when you pray, believing that you receive them, you will have them. So, so to really sum this up, essentially we're to have a heart that depends upon God. Jesus communicated very simply a message to his disciples that we're not to miss. Have faith in God, as verse 22 mentions. This is the way to live. Uh, this is the way to have life that is rich and full and meaningful. You must trust that the living God knows what he is doing. Believe what he says. Obey what he commands. And so uh, it, it is then he enriches us and draws us t- into a deeper love relationship with him and flows through us and makes us a fruitful person, being doers of the word, not just hearers only. There's a lot of people with a lot of head knowledge, but in their practical lives, they're not living it. They're not, there's no match there. Um, so have faith in God. And don't be afraid to demonstrate faith and courage to trust in the Lord. Uh, he is sovereign. He is in control. Um, they could remove a great mountain by faith now uh, we need to understand what a mountain was. it wasn't a physical mountain that he's talking about but it was a popular figure of speech saying an insurmountable problem is the idea behind this mountain so jesus is saying as we believe god can overcome any obstacle uh if this promise of god's answer to the prayer made in faith made the disciples Um, uh, not to the multitude. So as a follower of Christ, we can do this. Um, We shouldn't interpret verse uh, 24 as if you pray hard enough and really believe uh, God is obligated to answer your prayer. He's not obligated to answer your prayer. He is sovereign. He's in control. He knows what is best uh, for us. Um, uh, That that kind of faith is not faith in God. It's rather faith uh, in nothing but faith in faith or faith in feelings. If you have that type of, if I ask, you know, it's going to have to be demanded and, and, and it's like he's this genie up in the sky uh, when you're asking for things and demanding things. Um, but if Jesus had the power to curse away this tree, uh, didn't he have the power to make a, a, a fruit miraculous appear on the tree? He could have. Um, and of course, Jesus often wants to do cooperative work uh, both in and, and through us. Um, so there's this relationship that he wants to have with us. And maybe this mountain, it's a mountain of pride that we may have uh, uh, within the heart or within the mind. It's some obstacle that's hindering, that's blocking the flow of God in our life or in your faith. And so Jesus encouraged them to let go of those things, those hindrances, those mountains, whatever it may be. Uh, and and, uh, and then he also talks about forgiving those who um, uh, offend you or holding on to grudges as verse 25 says so whenever you stand praying if you have anything against anyone forgive him that your father in heaven may forgive your your trespasses but if you do not forgive neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses um, the importance of forgiveness this is the master key that we have in our life again as christ forgive us we ha- we ought to forgive other people uh, and like the very person that maybe you're holding a grudge against, uh, you need to forgive also. And it releases you. It releases that bitterness in your life. And, um, and have the courage to let it go. And when you let it go uh, of that unforgiveness, uh, you, you'll have the freedom to really enjoy your life. You know, you see so many people are bound up with unforgiveness in their life. So this was obviously an important message that Jesus wanted to communicate to the disciples and to communicate to us. The final verses of this chapter is where we read the the religious leaders' questions of verse 27 through 33. Uh, So again, he came to Jerusalem, verse 27, and he walking in the temple and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? So this obviously was a problem for uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders. Jesus wasn't looking to debate these guys, uh, these religious leaders. He wanted to teach the people and tell them about the good news. And uh, uh, the, the, the questioners uh, came to him. Um, and again, Jesus can handle any question, any doubt that we may have. 
Uh, Jesus had been extremely courageous and uh, by boldly entering Jerusalem and driving out those money changers and uh, merchants from the temple courts. And now this chief priest and the scribes and the elders want to know what makes him think he's got the right uh, that he can do such a thing. Uh, and that's a great question for, for people today. And, uh, you know, again, Jesus has the final authority. He has every right to inspect and to do what he needs to do. And uh, all authority is given to the, the Lord. Uh, and so Jesus questions uh, their question with the question. Notice verse 29. But Jesus answered and said to him, I will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The uh, baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And so they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, then they fear the, the people. For they all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, neither will we tell you that <clears throat> by what authority I do these things. So when Jesus asked them that, to answer the question regarding John the Baptist, he wasn't e evading their question. Uh, because if, uh, if John was from God, then he was right about Jesus, uh, that he was the Messiah. If uh, what John said was true, then uh, Jesus had all the authority. So essentially, this was a, 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 a thrust that cleared the air and defined their attitude both to John and to Jesus. And they rejected John, and now they rejected Jesus. So Jesus' question, it wasn't a trap. And yet it was a, another opportunity for them to realize and confess their blindness and ask for sight. Uh, but obviously they didn't do that. Uh, so the response to his question exposed the fact that these men were not sincere seekers of the truth. Uh, they cared more about uh, scorning the rhetorical points uh, in debate and pleasing the crowds than knowing the truth. Uh, and this is what was typical of these scribes and these Pharisees and these priests uh, at this time. Now, the, the rest of Tuesday, there, there's so much other things that take place uh, that go on there. Time doesn't permit. Wednesday, as we mentioned, is uh, more of silent uh, period of time this particular week. Uh, Thursday, the, the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane. Friday, the trial and, and the death and, and uh, burial of Christ. And uh, so we're, we're going to look at more of this on Good Friday, uh, what takes place uh, at that period of time. But if there's one thing to really get out of this particular time, not only do you see the triumphal entry, but also that uh, for us to be open to the Lord, uh, for Him to inspect and search our hearts and our lives, the cleansing of the temple uh, is such a powerful imagery for us today, uh, and to allow Him to break us and humble us of our pride, to heal and to restore and to mend and to build. Uh, and these are some things that God wants to do in our lives. But this last week, the Passion Week of Christ, spend some time in this week to come. Read through these particular chapters in Mark's Gospel, Luke and, and Matthew and John, and just to journey through this period of, of time with Jesus. And I would encourage you I, I, uh, to surrender uh, anything over to the Lord. May this week be a, a different week than we've ever experienced before, that we would truly come to the Lord and surrender uh, anything that uh, is displeasing, the secret sins in our life. Uh, Lord, uh, you died for these. Lord, help me to, to live in freedom uh, and liberty as you've called me to live. Uh, set me free from anything that would hinder my walk with you. Remove these mountains, uh, whatever that mountain may be in your life. And that... Um, Again, you'll never regret it, but you wish you would have uh, been set free and surrendered these areas of our hearts and our lives and thinking processes a long time ago. And, uh, but I encourage you, journey through this week um, in the scriptures uh, in this Passion Week. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. We thank you for this uh, story, this uh, event of the triumphal entry. And uh, what you did uh, during this Passion Week, the Holy Week, the events that transpire, that it speaks to us. If we had one week to live, what would we do? What would we say? And I pray that each and every one of us uh, would take uh, to heart what your word says in this week to come. That we would be doers of your word, not just hearers only. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for uh, dying on the cross for us, for um, rising again on the third day. 
given us the, uh, the power and the victory over sin and death uh, and how you've uh, uh, conquered uh, all that for us and how we can have a love relationship with you. So we thank you. I pray that you bless your precious people in Jesus' name. Amen.